Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The Snake Woman and King Ali Mardan, as presented by Flora Annie Steele. This story is from her book Tales of the Punjab, as told by the people, first published in 1894. Brief note that in this story, Steele uses the term Lamia, which is the evil snake woman of Greek mythology. I think, however, that the more correct term would be Nagini, the evil snake woman of South Asian mythology. It's a small technicality, but we do have to keep our monsters straight around here. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Once upon a time, King Ali Mardan went out a-hunting, and as he hunted in the forest above the beautiful Dal Lake, which stretches clear and placid between the mountains and the royal town of Srinagar, he came suddenly on a maiden, lovely as a flower, who, seated beneath a tree, was weeping bitterly. Bidding his followers remain at a distance, he went up to the damsel and asked her who she was and how she came to be alone in the wild forest. Oh, great king, she answered, looking up in his face. I am the emperor of China's handmaiden, and as I wandered about in the pleasure grounds of his palace, I lost my way. I know not how far I have come since, but now I must surely die, for I am weary and hungry. So fair a maiden must not die while Ali Marden can deliver her, quoth the monarch, gazing ardently on the beautiful girl. So he bade his servants convey her with the greatest care to his summer palace in the Shalimar Gardens, where the fountains scatter dewdrops over the beds of flowers, and laden fruit trees bend over the marble colonnades. And there, amid the flowers and sunshine, she lived with the king, who speedily became so enamored of her that he forgot everything else in the world. So the days passed until it chanced that a yogi's servant, coming back from the holy lake Gangabal, which lies on the snowy peak of Harmuk, whither he went every year to draw water for his master, passed by the gardens. And over the high garden wall he saw the tops of the fountains leaping and splashing like silver sunshine. He was so astonished at the sight that he put his vessel of water on the ground and climbed over the wall, determined to see the wonderful things inside. Once in the garden amidst the fountains and flowers, he wandered hither and thither, bewildered by beauty, until, wearied out by excitement, he lay down under a tree and fell asleep. Now the king, coming to walk in the garden, found the man lying there and noticed that he held something fast in his closed right hand. Stooping down, Ali Marden gently loosened the fingers and discovered a tiny box filled with a sweet-smelling ointment. While he was examining this more closely, the sleeper awoke and, missing his box, began to weep and wail, whereupon the king bade him be comforted and, showing him the box, promised to return it if he would faithfully tell why it was so precious to him. "'Oh, great king,' replied the yogi servant, the box belongs to my master, and it contains a holy ointment of many virtues. By its power I am preserved from all harm, and am able to go to Gangabal and return with my jar full of water in so short a time that my master is never without the sacred element. Then the king was astonished, and, looking at the man keenly, said, Tell me the truth. Is your master indeed such a holy saint? Is he indeed such a wonderful man? Oh, king, replied the servant, he is indeed such a man, and there is nothing in the world he does not know. This reply aroused the king's curiosity, and, putting the box in his vest, he said to the servant, Go home to your master, and tell him King Ali Mardan has his box, and means to keep it till he comes to fetch it himself. In this way, he hoped to entice the holy yogi into his presence. So the servant, seeing there was nothing else to be done, set off to his master, but he was two years and a half in reaching home because he had not the precious box with the magical ointment. 
And all this time, Ali Mardan lived with the beautiful stranger in the Shalimar Palace and forgot everything in the wide world except her loveliness. Yet he was not happy, and a strange look came over his face and a stony stare into his eyes. Now, when the servant reached home at last and told his master what had occurred, the yogi was very angry. But, as he could not get on without the box, which enabled him to procure the water from Gangabal, he set off at once to the court of King Ali Mardan. On his arrival, the king treated him with the greatest honor and faithfully fulfilled the promise of returning the box. Now, the yogi was indeed a learned man, and when he saw the king, he knew at once all was not right. So he said, O king! You have been gracious unto me, and I, in my turn, desire to do you a kind action. So, tell me truly, have you always had that white, scared face and those stony eyes? The king hung his head. Tell me truly, continued the holy yogi, have you any strange woman in your palace? Then Ali Mardan, feeling a strange relief in speaking, told the yogi about the finding of the maiden, so lovely and forlorn, in the forest. "'She is no handmaiden of the Emperor of China. She is no woman,' quoth the yogi fearlessly. "'She is nothing but a lamia, the dreadful two hundred years old snake, which has the power of taking woman's shape.' Hearing this, King Ali Mardin was at first indignant, for he was madly in love with the stranger. But when the yogi insisted, he became alarmed, and at last promised to obey the holy man's orders, and so discover the truth or falsehood of his words. Therefore, that same evening, he ordered two kinds of kuchri to be made ready for supper, and placed in one dish, so that one half was sweet kuchri and the other half salt. Now, when, as usual, the king sat down to eat out of the same dish with the snake woman, he turned the salt side towards her and the sweet side towards himself. She found her portion very salt, but, seeing the king eat his with relish and without remark, finished hers in silence. But when they had retired to rest, and the king, obeying the yogi's orders, had feigned sleep, the snake woman became so dreadfully thirsty, in consequence of all the salt food she had eaten, that she longed for a drink of water. And, as there was none in the room, she was obliged to go outside to get some. Now, if a snake woman goes out at night, she must resume her own loathsome form. So, as King Ali Mardan lay feigning sleep, he saw the beautiful form in his arms change to a deadly, slimy snake that slid from the bed out of the door into the garden. He followed it softly, watching it drink of every fountain by the way, until it reached the dull lake, where it drank and bathed for hours. Fully satisfied of the truth of the yogi's story, King Ali Mardan begged him for aid in getting rid of the beautiful horror. This the yogi promised to do if the king would faithfully obey orders. So they made an oven of a hundred different kinds of metal melted together and closed by a strong lid and a heavy padlock. This they placed in a shady corner of the garden, fastening it securely to the ground by strong chains. When all was ready, the king said to the snake woman, My heart's beloved, let us wander in the gardens alone today and amuse ourselves by cooking our own food. She, nothing loath, consented, and so they wandered about in the garden, and, when dinner time came, set to work with laughter and mirth to cook their own food. The king heated the oven very hot and kneaded the bread, But, being clumsy at it, he told the snake woman he could do no more, but that she must bake the bread. This she at first refused to do, saying that she disliked ovens, but when the king pretended to be vexed, averring she could not love him since she refused to help, she gave in and set to work with a very bad grace to tend the baking. Then, just as she stooped over the oven's mouth to turn the loaves, the king, seizing his opportunity, pushed her in and, clapping down the cover, locked and double-locked it. 
Now, when the snake woman found herself caught in the scorching oven, she bounded so that had it not been for the strong chains, she would have bounded out of the garden, oven and all. But, as it was, all she could do was to bound up and down, whilst the king and the yogi piled fuel onto the fire, and the oven grew hotter and hotter. So it went on from four o'clock one afternoon to four o'clock the next, when the snake woman ceased to bound, and all was quiet. They waited until the oven grew cold, and then opened it, when not a trace of the snake woman was to be seen, only a tiny heap of ashes, out of which the yogi took a small round stone and gave it to the king, saying, This is the real essence of the snake woman, and whatever you touch with it will turn to gold. But King Ali Mardan said that such a treasure was worth more than any man's life was worth, since it must bring envy and battle and murder to its possessor. So, when he went to Atok, he threw the magical snake stone into the river, lest it should bring strife into the world. The best sentence in this story is, So fair a maiden must not die while Ali Mardan can deliver her, quoth the monarch, gazing ardently on the beautiful girl. It's really such a great introduction to this character. I admit feeling some sympathy for the snake woman in this story. She can't help being a snake. And she seems pretty agreeable. She ate the salty food. She agreed to bake the bread. Burning her alive is pretty intense, considering she wasn't doing any harm. What even are stony eyes? This story reminds me so strongly of the painted skin, another story on this channel last year. The man spots a beautiful woman, he falls in love, he takes her home, and then a holy man sees him and says that he's bewitched and she's revealed to be a monster. Other aspects of these two stories are very different, but I guess they're both a kind of cautionary tale against beautiful strangers. As I mentioned in the beginning, Steele uses the word lamia to describe this monster, probably because Greek mythology is more familiar to her and her readers. But the Nagas of Asian mythology are a distinct creature. Generally speaking, Nagas are divine or semi-divine creatures that have or they can take the shape of a serpent. They've been worshipped in the Asian world for over 2,000 years. They're said to be descendants of Kadru, the daughter of one of the gods of creation, and Kashyapa, a mind son of Brahma and the most ancient and venerated of the rishis, who had a thousand serpent sons together. Nagas dwell in the underworld, but it's not a a hell-type underworld. It's more like a subterranean dimension full of treasure, beauty, and luxury. Interestingly, in the Western Himalayas, where this story takes place, there's a very special set of rituals around the local Naginis. While all Nagas are strongly associated with water, in this area, where springs are relied upon to cultivate the local rice crops, these are blessed deities. And twice a century, the mother goddess Naginis are brought out through ritual symbols and objects, and for six months they're toured around the region for a set of rituals and events intended to re-establish family ties among women who have married and moved to other villages. I also love that this story takes place in real cities. Srinagar is the home of the famous Shalimar Gardens, the peak of Mughal horticulture, in an area famous for the 17th century Mughal gardens. Mughal emperors created these incredible gardens for their summer pleasure palaces, and, as indicated in the story, the Shalimar Gardens in Srinagar do connect to Dal Lake. I did look to see if there was a likely river between Srinagar and Atok where the king might have thrown the snake stone, but there are a lot of rivers in the region and nothing stood out to me. Perhaps someday I'll find a different local legend that continues the story. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is... Can we just talk for a minute about dirt? I completely understand that things that are used or touched or worn or walked on get dirty. But it is also true that things that are not used or worn or walked on get dirty. Things that are just sitting on a shelf or in the bottom of a closet or behind the couch, dirty. 
How does it happen that if I don't look at something for a few weeks or months, it gets dirty? How do windows get dirty? I don't smear things on my windows. I can't even reach all my windows. How does the carpet in my stairs get so much hair on it? In Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, Philip K. Dick talked about kipple, the debris that builds up when people stop putting in the effort to remove it. So it's broken umbrellas and scraps of paper and old receipts and dead flies and breadcrumbs and gum wrappers and all of the things that accumulate in corners and behind your couch cushions and in the backs of closets and in the bottoms of purses. He says that kipple reproduces itself. If you leave it, there becomes more of it. He also says the world is moving toward a state of kippleization and the only resistance is a sort of constant amount of human effort. I think it's also true that kippleization happens object by object, like a precious love letter or a postcard from a friend or your high school picture. They're all on their way to being kipple, no matter how loved they are. Armchairs and bathtubs and whole houses will become kipple if they're left long enough. Even you and I, my friend, are on the way to becoming kipple, shedding our hairs and our fingernail clippings and our dead skin cells and whatnot along the way until we're just so much detritus. <laughs> so, wait, I guess I've answered my own question and that's where all the dirt comes from. <laughs> if you are curious about the origins of things and weird literary references, you should subscribe to this channel. At Restored Lore, I find weird, old, odd, and obscure stories and bring you a new one every week, and you wouldn't want to miss anything. Please also like this video if you like it, drop me a comment, share it if you think it's worth sharing. It really does help the channel grow, and I appreciate it so much. See you next week.